Phyrexia pre-release is approaching quickly and I'm going to prepare you as best as I possibly can for this event, what to expect when you're at the event, what you get, the archetypes in the set, and which cards you should be looking out for. I do hope you enjoy the video and if you do, be sure to hit the like button. His name is Steven, he loves the attention. First things first, if this is your first pre-release event or you're returning to the game after a long break, a pre-release is the perfect place to do that. The atmosphere is pretty casual, most everyone is there to have fun, you can ask questions, get help from others, try not to feel intimidated. The pre-release is and always has been a casual event, so you're in a safe place as a new player. Some more general tips. Pre-release events can last a while, so make sure to bring something to drink, maybe even a snack. I would also bring a pen or a pencil and some paper to keep track of life totals, and at least 50 sleeves to sleeve up your cards. Lastly, you're going to be inside for a while, in close quarters with a bunch of other people, so make sure that you shower before your event. Trust me, it'll be better for everyone. When you show up to your pre-release event, you'll get one of these nifty little boxes for the event. Inside it are six Phyrexia, all will be one draft boosters, a foil stamped rare or mythic rare, a deck box, and a spin down die. If you're lucky, you might get a cool looking Phyrexia inspired die like this one. Nice. Now the format for pre-release is sealed deck, which means you open the six packs in front of you and make the best 40 card deck that you possibly can out of only those cards. So no need to bring any others to the store for the event, all you need is contained in this box. So you start the event, get your box, open it, freak out if you get that awesome Phyrexia themed die, then open your six packs. From these packs, you need to make a 40 card deck with roughly 23 non-land cards and 17 lands. This is generally where you're going to want to be. There are situations where running 16 or 18 lands could be correct, but for the vast majority of decks, 23 non-lands, 17 lands. The first thing you're going to want to do is look at your rares and mythics and gush about opening a planeswalker and I understand that approach, it's basically human nature but I use a different strategy. You can't count on a single rare or mythic to win you the game every time. You need depth in your colors you're playing. I start by separating all the removal spells. This is a great way to see where your strengths really are. Removal is basically mandatory and limited. There are going to be threats you simply can't get rid of in combat and you're going to need some answers. Find which of your colors are strongest in removal and make a note of them. After removal, dive into your rares, mythics, and the rest of your cards. I like to do process of elimination, separate all your cards into their respective colors, then go through each color, removing cards that have such a specific use they're better off as sideboard cards than main deck cards. For rares, this means cards like Encroaching Mycosin, Soulless Jailer, and Mirror and Safe House. All these cards have uses, but not great in a limited environment. For non-rares, look for cards that counter specific things or have incredibly narrow uses that require a complete deck build around them. Minor Misstep, Duress, Against All Odds, and Carnivorous Canopy are good examples. The canopy can be a great card, but it can also blank, so leave it in your sideboard. This set was designed to support two color decks in limited, so Wizards created 10 different archetypes across all color pairs to accommodate basically any distribution of cards. Once you get rid of the super specific cards, start looking for synergies among what's left. Let's quickly go over each archetype included in this set, and for the record, I'll be using commons and uncommons as examples of what to look for, as the rares are pretty self-explanatory. And to save some time, each of the flagship uncommons in each color player is worth playing in their respective decks, so I won't spend too much time on them. The white and blue theme is artifacts. The color comes with a plethora of artifacts and cards that benefit from artifacts merely just existing. Mandible Justicar, Veil of Assimilation, Escaped Experiment, and Eye of Malkator hint at the synergy, and then more explosive cards like Plated Onslaught, Unctus's Retrofitter, and Tamiyo's Logbook drive it home. This theme is a little different than some we're going to cover because it isn't one you have to dedicate your whole deck to. It's a simple strategy, which means simple payoffs. More than likely you'll fall into this deck by accident if your best cards just happen to be in white and blue, as those are the two colors with the most artifacts. So while there are synergies here and plenty of great cards that help the artifact cause, like Might Producer's Basilica Shepherd in Charge of the Mites, I wouldn't tunnel vision on building blue-white artifacts only. The payoff is just a bit shallow. You can build a strong blue-white deck that has artifact shenanigans in it definitely, but just don't include an artifact synergy card over a better general blue-white card simply because it's a hashtag artifact. The blue-black archetype in this set is Control with a proliferate sub-theme. Almost every single common and uncommon in both blue and black use oil counters, inflict poison counters, or proliferate. Blue-black can only really be controlled as a color pair in this set, so to figure out if your card pool can support this color pair, look for removal like Mesmerizing Doze, Annihilating Glare, Anoint with Affliction, and Drown a Nicker. In addition to removal, anything to stall the game also plays in blue-black's favor. Tamiyo's Immobilizer and Serum Snare are good examples of this. If you do have removal and disruption in these colors, it's likely you can build a sealed deck with nearly any combination of other blue and black cards and have it work just fine. 
Getaxian Raptor, Meldweb Strider, Watchful Blister Zoa, and Necrosquito are all very strong with oil counters. Bilius Skull Dweller, Blight Belly Rat, Nimrazor Paladin, Shieldred's Head Cleaver, and more all inflict poison counters. And then you can proliferate either or both of those in both blue and black with Getaxian Anatomist, Thrumming Bird, Vivisurgeon's Insight, Vat Emergence, and more. And then even beyond that, you have Corrupted Value in Bone Picker Scourge, Fleshless Gladiator, Ravenous Necro Titan, and more. The important thing to remember is that all these cards just happen to work together together and are actually not bad individually. So look for removal and disruption and then simply just how many playable blue and black cards you have. If you can reach 23 cards with a decent amount of removal, that deck will probably be good. The black red archetype is oil counters matter with a sacrifice sub theme. This is the first archetype we're talking about that has significant payoffs for building around its mechanic. Oil counters feel more like a creature type with how they synergize. Koldatha Cackler and Urobras Anointer want mass oil counter permanence. Then you have cards that get individually more powerful the more counters they accrue, like Exuberant Fusling, Vat of Rebirth, and Necrosquito. What is unique about red is that it's the only color that aggressively places oil counters. Churning Reservoir and Magmatic Sprinter are designed to pump up the power of your oil counter creatures. Cards like Axiom Engraver, Forge Hammer, Centurion, and Furnace Strider gain a lot of value from the other red cards that add oil counters, as well as the black cards that proliferate. Cards like the aforementioned Anointer and Cackler can both be very strong, but only if your card pool has enough oil counters to support them, so if it doesn't, don't force it. Now, there is a sacrifice subtheme in this color pair, but many of the best payoffs are in the uncommon slot or higher, which means it isn't likely to be a major focus of your deck. But if you do get a combination of Char Forger, Necrosquito, Exuberant Fusing, and Shittering Skitterling, might be worth looking at. Just make sure you have enough expendable creatures and artifacts to reliably fuel these greedy cards. The Skull Bombs are great for that, Chimney Rabo, Gleeful Demolition, and Stinging Hive Master are on theme filler cards worth looking out for if you have the aforementioned payoffs. This isn't the easiest deck to build, so don't force it, but if you open enough cards for it, it should be pretty obvious what you have in front of you. The red-green archetype in this set is oil counters good stuff, and no I'm not kidding, all the oil counter cards we just spoke about in red are strong in this deck as well, but instead of adding a sub-theme, green adds value creatures and more oil counter synergy. Armored Scrap Gorger, Evolving Adaptive, Incubation Sack, Lattice Blade Mantis, and Oil Gorger Troll are not only decent or better cards by themselves, but perfect for the oil counter synergy that red brings along. You're going to be playing all the red playables we've spoken about before so we don't need to talk about them again, but as far as green is concerned just look for good cards, removal is great. Contagious Vorak, Adaptive Spore Singer, Venomous Brutalizer. The green cards that look good are good. Refreshingly straightforward, but by no means weak. This will likely be a creature-based mid-range strategy, and you will bully opponents on the ground. Simplicity is not weakness here. The green-white theme is toxic with a token sub-theme, but the sub-theme is more incidental as it's just an extension of the toxicity that's already taking place. The color pair plays creatures with toxic, produces creatures with toxic, then buffs creatures with toxic. Thanks to the mechanic toxic, basically every creature applies a lot of pressure. Branch Blight Stalker, Icker Spit Basilisk, Duelist of Deep Faith, and Flensing Raptor are all commons with toxic that are either annoying via their stat line or do something annoying. Then you can see the minor token strategy with cards like Basilica Shepherd, Charge of the Mites, and Doctrination Attack and viral spawning. The color pair is impressively deep on ways to get toxic creatures onto the battlefield. Be sure to look for toxic payoff cards to see if it's worth going into the strategy specifically. Plague Nurse, Porcelain Zealot, and Complete Devotion are good examples of this, but only worth including if you have enough toxic commons and uncommons to have their toxic conditions met reliably. Lastly, this is a fast deck. Most of your toxic creatures are low to the ground and are generally good at bullying early drop creatures, so press your advantage if you go green-white. Combat tricks like Tyvar Stana Titanic Growth gain some value here, and game-winning cards like Noxious Assault can be important. Now, you can include giant on-theme creatures, I'm thinking of Paladin of Predation when I say this, but remember that unlike many of the creatures we've been speaking about in this video, the green-white toxic creatures don't tend to grow more powerful as the game goes on, so your opponent's later game drops will likely outscale your own. Try to keep your eye on the prize and end the game quickly. The white-black archetype is corrupted by way of toxicity. All the white toxic cards we just spoke about are also in this deck, but instead of pairing them with value creatures, they are paired with cards that are incredibly powerful once your opponent has three poison counters. Black adds some toxic enablers like Bilius Skull Dweller, Blight Belly Rat, Pestilence Cipher, and Shieldred's Head Cleaver. When Corrupted is finally turned on, the white black deck gains late game power along with more efficient removal and disruption. Look for payoffs like Sinew Dancer, Ravenous Necro Titan, Bone Picker Scourge, and Apostle of Invasion. Consistent Corruption also gives subpar cards new life. Incisor Glider and Zealot's Conviction are both playable with Corrupted. I would go as far as to say that all white black Corrupted cards are worth considering as long as you have a solid creature base that mostly has Toxic. This color combination requires strong payoff, so be sure you have a plan to end the game. You need your corruption to mean something.
The blue-red color pair is awkward. The archetype is supposed to be oil counters accrued through casting non-creature spells, but there are only five common or uncommons in the set that synergize directly with this plan, and three of them are uncommons. So while on paper, everyone is going to say that this is the color pair for tons of value from casting non-creature spells, I don't believe that would be the reality for most players. If anything, a focus on non-creature spell casting specifically will be a sub-theme of any deck built unless you literally get multiple Serum Core Chimera and Trawler Drake. Most of the time, this is a deck will play like a normal oil counter and proliferate deck, which isn't bad. These colors go together quite well in that respect. Between the two colors, there are 20 cards that care about oil counters and another nine playable cards that proliferate. So while yes, you will be including more non-creature spells than most any other deck, don't play non-creature spells that don't interact with exactly what you're doing just for the sake of playing more non-creatures. This deck is about value first and foremost, but as a quick note, if you do end up with a bunch of those Chimera or Drakes, you can include equipment in your deck to count towards your non-creature spells, especially the ones that come with a 2-2 Rebel attached. That gets to trigger your card and gives you board presence. It's a win-win, so keep it in mind. The black green archetype is Toxic Beatdown with a small recursion sub theme. There are a whopping 19 commons and uncommons that either have toxic or make things toxic in these colors. Now, what makes the color combination unique is that it has play over the course of the entire game. There are creatures at every part of the curve eight toxic targets at two mana or less, three at three mana, five at four mana, two at five mana, and one at seven. What this means is that the black green toxic deck is made to be competitive at each stage of a match, from oppressive early drops like Blanche Light Stalker and Icker Spit Basilisk, all the way up to Tyranax Atrocity and Paladin of Predation. Now, what's arguably most important to remember is that Proliferate is almost as important as Toxic itself. Both green and black have strong Proliferate cards. Include all previously mentioned green and black Proliferate cards we've spoken about, even if they don't have Toxic. This deck is about putting on the pressure early and then literally never stopping until the game is over. Now, one final note. The small recursion sub-theme, yeah, you can include basically any card you see that brings something back. Draw Skull Bomb, Fleshless Gladiator, Necrogen Communion, Nimrazer Paladin, Unnatural Restoration, Vat of Rebirth, all of them are live in this stream strategy. Another straightforward deck to be sure, but remember the fundamentals. Removal, Toxic, Proliferate, Win. The red-white archetype is equipment aggro utilizing the new mechanic for Mirrodin. If you're playing this deck, you need to be comfortable with a proactive, aggressive playstyle. The equipment available to you is almost exclusively aggressive, and almost all of it hits the battlefield attached to a 2-2, which means you can look at these equipment as if they were creatures. Barbed Batterfist is a 2-mana 3-1. Hexgold Halberd is a 2-mana 2-2 with First Strike and Trample on your turn. You need to see them this way when building this deck. Because there are a healthy number of common and uncommon equipment, you will get some in your card pool, but what's nice is you don't need an over abundance to run them. Thanks to Four Mirrodin, all these equipment have individual value in any red-white aggro deck. They aren't aggressively costed, but they nearly all come with combat-relevant keywords or power buffs. A note that may help is if you see any red or white card that even mentions equipment at all, it is worth including in your equipment deck. Of course you want Bladecraft Aspirin and Oxidative Finisher as enabler and payoff, but Leon and Lightbringer and Resistance Reunited are both worth including if you have a healthy number of equipment. If you don't, you can still play nearly all the equipment you open, but the equipment synergy card cards will be less valuable. The blue-green archetype is last, and of course it's one of the more complicated ones. The theme here is proliferate, that's it. Just proliferate literally everything. Oil counters, poison counters, loyalty counters on planes, walkers you open because you're lucky. The entire deck is about proliferation. There are a combined 17 commons and uncommons in this color pair that proliferate, 16 cards that care about oil counters, and 11 that either have or grant toxic. Building this type of deck isn't going to be straightforward, and it may not jump right out at you immediately, it's subtle. Blue-green in this limited environment is about playing the best blue and green creatures alongside the best blue and green spells and take advantage of the built-in synergies that wizards put in the color pair. You won't be able to win with this color pair on the back of just the commons, so look for these cards as possible signs. Evolving Adaptive, Tainted Observer, Venomous Brutalizer, and Paladin of Predation. You probably need at least some of these or some bomb mythics or rares to justify going blue-green. The reason I'm being so severe with this color pair is that it has the weakest removal suite of any two color pair in the set, which means you need to make up for that value somehow, and it is not easy to do that. So I'm not telling you to not play blue-green but I am warning you that you do need some high value cards to make it a real threat even with the myriad synergies it brings. For those of you asking for a list of the best general commons and uncommons for deck inclusion regardless of archetype synergy, there will be an entire video dedicated to that called the Draft Guide, and it's coming to you real soon, so please subscribe and remember to stay tuned for that. Hopefully this video helped you out, and if you have any questions, comments, concerns, anything at all, be sure to leave them in the comments and we'll talk about it. And as always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time!